Hi everybody. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Kayla and I am the co-founder of a movement called 22 Matters and my daughters are the reason behind the movement. Their names are Luna and Emma and they are turning three on September 27th. And so for their third birthday, um, I thought it would be a good idea to come on here and share a little bit of their birth story as well as share a little bit of what 22 Matters is and share a little bit of who the twins are now that they are turning three. I'm gonna try to keep this video um, as short as I possibly can. I'm gonna try to keep this video as emotionless as I possibly can. I don't wanna be a sobbing, crying mess. I have thought of recording this video for years now leading up to the twins' first and second birthday and I just wasn't mentally stable enough at that time to do so. Now I am, I feel mentally stable. September is always a really hard month for me because it is the twins' birth month. This is the first September that I have felt this mentally stable in this month so I thought this would be a good time to share the twins birth story I also wanted to share the twins birth story so if they ever ask when they're older the details um I wanted to be able to have them as fresh in my mind as possible so I could relay them to them as accurate as possible I'm gonna say that there might be some things today that um might be blurred or I might share things that I haven't haven't shared before when I've shared the twin story and that's just because I was diagnosed with something called PTSD so one of the side effects from that for me is I actually hide or my mind suppresses a lot of memories I guess it's like a coping mechanism for me to protect myself emotionally so over the years there has thing, been things that have come up I have forgotten things I have remembered things and vice versa so I just ask that you be patient with me if you have read or heard of Luna and Emma's story before it's been shared on a couple large platforms as well as our Facebook page and Instagram called 22 matters I just ask that you bear with me and if there's some new information then that's great that you get to know. And if there, if I ever miss anything out, um, again, just ask that you guys bear with me. So I'm going to start off with saying that Luna and Emma, I got pregnant with them in 2018. Yes, well, yeah, okay. 2018, it was, I had, we had our son Noah at the time and I was with my, I was married to my husband. I think we were married for about three years at that. Yeah, about three years at that time because it's our six year wedding anniversary just passed. Me and my husband have been together almost 13 years now. And at that time, Noah was just about to turn two. A couple months shy of turning two when I got pregnant. So when we got pregnant for the twins, we went to our six week ultrasound and I actually went to a four week ultrasound right when I found out and they actually told me, oh, you're not pregnant. Um, it might be too early just come back so I went back two weeks later and not only was I pregnant I was pregnant with twins it was a huge shock twins run on both sides of mine and my husband's family so I'm not sure why I was so shocked maybe because I had a singleton already and I we planned to have two kids and God obviously had other plans for us so the pregnancy started off well. I had had a midwife, I had a midwife with Noah, so I had the same midwife for the twins pregnancy. She is more like family than she is was medical care for me. So I felt very comfortable and very confident with her. My pregnancy was very routine for being pregnant with twins. We've ne we never seen any type of um, scares or anything like that. So we thought we were progressing along very well. I was gaining the appropriate weight. I was growing very rapidly, but otherwise, well, we found out around 18 weeks that the twins were both girls, which was again, also a shock to me because I always pictured myself as a boy mom and then I'm gonna have these two little girls and it was such a shock. And then around when I was about, no, when I was 22, 20 weeks pregnant, I, at that time, I also was running a daycare. I should add that. I was running an in-home daycare. I had my son, Noah, who was one, gonna be two, and then I had two other little kids with me, two little girls. So one morning of my daycare, I was taking a shower while the, 
the kiddos were napping and I had like this gush of fluid so I called one of the kiddos moms and I said hey like you gotta come I called both kiddos moms hey can you come pick up the kids and um because I feel like I have like this gush of fluid so they came one of the moms was so gracious to stay with Noah for me so I could go to the hospital when I went to the hospital they did like the little vaginal swab and they're like oh there's no there's no um fluid like picking up but just just because um of the scare we're going to now bump you into the high risk category so when the high risk when i was bumped into the high risk category my midwife had to bring on an ob and just to let you guys know that i will not be disclosing any of the names of the doctors involved in these i will call them um, like Mr. Mrs. T or but I won't be giving out their full name just because we're three years in and I don't feel like it's appropriate at this time the things that there has been things that have been done to um, help this situation so just to let you guys know I won't be giving out full names so I was bumped in my I was bumped into the high risk category and my midwife had to bring on a high risk OB, Dr. M. So Dr. M was brought onto my care and because of the scare, I was now going to see my midwife and Dr. M every two weeks. Okay, so we're in now. So now we're at 20 weeks and then so the next my next ultrasound would be every two weeks until I had given birth. So now we fast forward a week and five days to be exact. I had woken up and I had was feeling like a cold was coming on. One of my daycare kiddos was sick, so I was feeling like a cold was coming on. I called off my daycare just because I felt so crappy. And I remember I put Noah down for a nap and my husband was working afternoons at that time and he was outside in the back doing something. And I put Noah down for a nap and I had went to the washroom and when I wiped, there was a little bit of pink blood call my midwife hey you know I just went to the bathroom and I just wiped there's a little bit of pink blood otherwise I'm feeling fine I feel like I'm getting a cold but otherwise like I'm not having any other symptoms there was no cramping there was nothing so my midwife says okay I want you to go to the hospital just so we can rule out that you don't have a I believe it was a bladder infection or yeast infection one of those I say okay you know I really ought to be honest I really didn't want to go and I was like oh are you sure like I'm supposed to see you you and dr. A, dr. M in two days like it was my two-week appointment was coming up we were at 21 weeks and five days she's like no I, do, I don't want to I don't want to leave it please just go in so I tell my husband I say hey I'm just gonna run to the hospital really quick so they can swab me make sure I don't have a yeast infection do an ultrasound on the girls and I'll be back within an hour before you have to go to work he says, okay, my midwife says, I'm not going to come with you. Very routine, very quick. I'm going to call up there, let them know that you're coming. They'll take care of you. And then you should be out of there within an hour or so. Perfect. And then it all came crashing down after that. So I arrived to the hospital. I get checked in. They say, okay, perfect. Your midwife has called. Um, just go sit in the waiting room. And when they're ready for you, they'll come. Okay. So about I'm sitting in the waiting room. A bunch of pregnant moms are now coming in and out we're about an hour in I'm noticing like there's a mom moms are coming way after me and they're being called in way before me and I'm like oh this is weird like what what the crap um I maybe these people had an appointments and I'm just a walk-in so and as I'm sitting there I'm starting to grow increasingly uncomfortable so my lower back starts to ache a lot I'm starting to get just very cramped lots of cramps in the abdominal area and mind you i have already birthed a eight pound baby so i know the typical signs of labor i started getting braxton hicks at this time i'm thinking i'm really dehydrated i didn't bring anything to drink i'm pregnant with twins i haven't eaten now i'm sitting there it was four hours now and i'm sitting there four hours without anything to drink anything to eat i haven't eaten in hours i'm obviously getting my i'm getting crampy because the babies need nutrition my body is running out of the energy that it had stored up I call my midwife and they say hey you know I don't want to be a bug but I've been in here for four hours now not a single person has came in here and seen me and there's been pregnant mamas in and out after me and I'm just wondering like what's going on and she was like what do you mean they haven't seen you and I'm like yeah I've been here for four hours and nobody has seen me she call, so she gets off the phone with me. She calls up to the hospital and the hospital tells her, we forgot you sent your patient, your 
patient up here for four hours. You would think that the nurses that came in and out and seen me there while they took other patients back would say, hey, you've, I've seen your face here the last 10 times I've come back here. What are you here for? But I digress. So they had forgotten about me for four hours. So all of a sudden a nurse comes running in and she says, oh my God, Miss Ivera, we're so sorry. I don't know what happened, how this got away from us. We're gonna rush you back. So by the time they rush me back, I am growing increasingly uncomfortable. I am so uncomfortable. I'm cramping, my back is so sore. I'm telling, the, I told the nurse, I said, listen, I said, I am so uncomfortable right now. And they're like, you're probably dehydrated, etc." I go to the washroom so they can do the swab to rule out the yeast or bladder infection. They put me in a bed finally. So now I'm laying in the bed waiting for my results and waiting for them to call up my midwife. And they put me in the bed and I'm telling them, I'm like, okay, this is so like something's wrong. This is so uncomfortable. And I hear the nurse call my midwife and I hear her in the thing and she says, yeah, so we just got Miss Ivera's urine sample back and it's clean. And the minute they said that, hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, I'm in labor. This is what's happening right now. I'm in labor. At first I thought dehydrated yeast infections coming on or bladder infection. But then the minute they ruled that out, I'm like, this is labor. I'm in labor. So the nurse comes and she says, Miss Ibera, we're going to take you down for an ultrasound. And I looked at her and I was bawling my eyes out. And I said, I think I'm in labor. And she's like, no, 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 honey, like you're fine. You're just, you're working yourself up, you're fine, you're fine. And I'm like, I'm telling you right now, I'm in labor. I'm not fine, I'm in labor. No, 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 you're fine, you're fine. They put me in a wheelchair, they wheel me down to the ultrasound room. I'm on the ultrasound table and I'm laying there and I am in excruciating pain. Like I'm telling you, I'm in severe pain. And I'm telling the text checking, she sees the girls. Oh, there's the girls. Yeah, they look so good. They're bouncing around, they're happy. Heartbeats are good, everything's good. And I'm like to her, I'm pretty sure I'm having full on contractions. Like I am fully in labor. And she's like, no, 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 honey, I think you're fine. But they do want to check your cervix. You just need to relax. They do want to check your cervix. So I'm going to have to do an internal exam. I said, okay, that's fine, but I'm, telling you right now I'm having contractions I birthed an eight pound baby before I'm having contractions she leaves the room I said you know what while you go get prepped for your internal I'm gonna need to stand up because I need to breathe through these contractions like I can't be laying flat on this bed oh sure honey move around like get yourself comfortable I stand up and I remember the bed in front of me and I just put my hands on it as I'm standing and I'm swaddling myself back and forth. If you've ever had a baby, you know, this is one of the typical movements to relieve those contractions. So I'm swaddling, breathing through the contractions. Mind you, nobody's at the hospital with me. My husband's at home with the, with the baby. Actually, my somebody tapped him out so he could go to work and somebody was watching Noah at the time. So he's at work now. Nobody is there with me. And if you do not know, my my mom had passed away that July so it was July August September it was two months after my mom's passing unexpected passing so I have nobody my sisters weren't there my brothers weren't there my sister-in-law's nobody I'm there solo by myself for the last five probably about five and a half six hours now and all of a sudden I'm just rocking rocking and boom my water breaks the tech walks in she's like <gasps> and I said do you believe me now that I'm in labor and she's like oh my god okay one moment we gotta call somebody so now i'm like what is ha what is gonna happen what is gonna happen so they call the doctor on that's on was on working there dr t they call them down they come down with they come down with a whole team dr t check i'm now back on the bed dr t, t checks and says yes you have ruptured membranes your water broke and so they're wheeling me out and as they're wheeling me out to the elevators, I'm hyperventilating at this time. And I said, what is gonna happen to my babies? I'm 21 weeks and five days at this point. What is gonna happen to my babies? And she presses the elevator button very casually, very casually, presses the elevator button. And she says, Mrs. Ibera, I'm sorry. Babies this, this born this early do not survive. The girls will be born tonight and they will die. And she wheels me into the elevator. 
just like that. Very matter of fact. I think that, I think that scene is probably one of the hardest scenes for me emotionally. The first time that somebody could be so matter of fact about the life of my kids was literally crippling to me. I was crippled in that moment. So she rolls me upstairs. Now I'm in a delivery room. Midwife, I don't even know how these people, how all of these people found out, but they were there. My midwife was there. My two sister-in-laws were there. My mother-in-law was there and my husband were now there in the room while, by the time I got back up there. And they're, they have nurses in there, are all hooking me up. My midwife is there. Everybody's hooking me up with IVs. I'm in still in excruciating pain, you guys. I'm in active labor. I'm asking for pain medicine. I'm bawling my eyes out, uncontrolled, uncontrollably. Bawling my eyes out. And the doctor, the nurses were also crying. So there's a room full of nurses. The nurses are bawling their eyes out. My husband, my mother-in-law, my everybody's crying. The nurses are rubbing my back. They're apologizing. We can't believe this is happening. We're so sorry. This is going to happen to you. And it was like I was in a twilight zone. So I, they tell me, okay, so we're going to give you Pitocin to speed this up. And I said, absolutely not. You're not giving me Pitocin. There has to be somebody. There has to be some hospital that will is willing to intervene. And they're like, no, nobody will save a baby, especially twins, at 21 weeks and five days. It is literally, utterly impossible. It cannot happen. Nobody's going to do that. You need to give birth to these babies. We will put them on your chest and you're gonna have to say your goodbyes. And I said, no, I'm not. I refuse to take Pitocin from you. And at this time they had given me um, morphine in my leg and the morphine had really relaxed me and brought me back to reality. Okay, Kayla, it's game time. You, you, just, you need to get it together. And I remember in that scene, I just remember that the doctors and the nurses hooking me up to IVs and my midwife with the doctor and they were going back and forth and were I remember people some people were on Google trying to find a hospital around us that would save that early and I just remember my sister-in-law saying you know what we need to do right now we need to pray and I just remember being so mad and saying I refuse to pray to a God that I have served faithfully for years that is gonna let me give birth to my daughters right now and die let them die in my arms I refuse to pray to that kind of God and I just remember being so angry at him I'm like I am so angry that this could happen to me that this could happen to them I was furious at God at that moment and so now things are just happening around me we have my sister-in-laws are praying my midwife is also a christian she's praying husband's praying mother-in-law's praying and you know i was just like okay let's get focused and you know i just said i said listen god i'm angry and i hope you know that i hope you know how mad i am at you right now that you can let me in this situation and i just want to see the bigger picture if there's a bigger picture let me see it because i am losing a battle right now and i'm mad and I just, say one more. And I just remember my contractions just stopped. <laughs> they just stopped. The pain was gone. I was no longer in pain in that moment. My active contractions were no longer picking up on the monitor. I was eased. My body was settled. It was calm. And I remember the Dr. T coming back in and saying, <laughs> we're gonna give you pitocin like you need to take the pitocin you need to get this over with it's not you don't even she said you don't even have time for an epidural they're so tiny this is gonna be so quick and i looked at her and i said you're not giving me anything i absolutely refuse for you to put anything in my body i will not jumpstart this labor i absolutely refuse to jumpstart this labor 
now she's going face to face with um, my midwife. She told my midwife that she needed to leave the hospital. She was no longer over care of me. My midwife said, absolutely not. My midwife found out that London saved at 24 weeks. And so she said, can we call there? Can we ask? And they said, she didn't, absolutely not. She's 21 weeks. They're not going to help. They're I'm not wasting the time. I'm not wasting my time. Your time was five minutes. That's all it would have, but I'm not wasting my time. And she looks at me and says, you know what, Miss Iberia? You're postponing the inevitable. These girls are going to be born, whether tonight or tomorrow, and they're going to die. So you're just postponing the inevitable. The inevitable. But you know what? Your contractions have stopped. So what we will do is we will now move you from the active labor room to a resting room. But I'm telling you right now, we will not let you see your, the daughters, your, your girls on ultrasound. We will not monitor their heartbeats or anything like that because you know what? I don't want my nurses getting any more emotionally involved in this when you just want to postpone the inevitable. I said, that's fine. Bring me to the, bring me to the resting room. So now I was brought to a resting room. That was the last and only time that I seen Dr. T. That was the extent of our relationship was that. They bring me to a resting room and you know, I'm in there. Things slowly start to die down and you know, people slowly start to leave. My husband goes and tends to our baby at home. Um, in-laws start to leave everybody starts to leave and then it's just me i'm in this bed my body's propped like this because we googled ways to stay pregnant not because the not because the doctors gave us suggestions on that and i'm just there laying there in that cold room by myself in complete and utter shock that this was about to be my life I get a couple of more doses of morphine because I then come to realize that I'm pretty sure this morphine is postponing my pregnant, my labor. So I'm like asking for as much morphine as I can get. So, and then I fall asleep. I remember waking up in the middle of the night thinking this is just a dream. And I woke up and I was still there. I wasn't dreaming at all. Next day comes around and they send in Dr. M. So the high risk OB that I was originally gonna see within two days, he was gonna be on my care from then on. And he starts to tell me things like, so like these babies cannot survive at this gestation you understand that there's no hospital around us that will take these babies under 24 weeks you are extremely active labor there's no way that you're going to make it four weeks you're just postponing the inevitable being pregnant it's just not possible you need to give birth to these babies and you need to say your goodbyes and i said no it is what it is i, I refuse until you find somebody to help me, I refuse to give birth to them. I refuse. I will hold them in me as long as I humanly possible because while they're in me, their hearts are beating and they have a chance of life. And I refused. So fine. Enjoy your day here. And he left. My sisters came. Um, other family had came. My sisters were an extreme help to me. They were, they had to slide the bedpan under me so I could use the washroom. They cleaned me, they sat there with me, they brushed my hair. My, my, they brought my boy up, my husband brought my boy up, which was the hardest thing to look at him and I had never been away from him before this moment. So it was excruciating that day. And then we go on to day three. Day three, they send in the NICU team. So the NICU team comes in and they say, you know, I've never personally seen a baby survive this early. We don't think it's physically possible. And if a ba this baby was to, these babies were to survive, say they possibly, po something magical would happen that they would survive, your daughters would be extremely disabled. They would be, 
unable to eat, unable to walk, unable to talk. They would have zero quality of life, Mrs. Ibera. Is that what you want for them? And I said, if that's how God wants me, that's the kind of God, that's the kind of mother God wants me to be. I want it. I want them however they come. I don't care if I have to take care of them every day for the rest of their lives. I want them. <laughs> he looked down at his chart and he said, you know what? If you were my wife, you know what I'd tell you right now? And I said, what? What would you tell me? He said, I'd say fight like hell. And that was the first time that I had any glimmer of hope that there was a doctor in that hospital seeing past the textbook and looking at the human part of it. The NICU team, they said, unfortunately, we can't help you. We don't have the capability to help babies under 27 weeks is just our threshold. We can't help you. And then they leave. And then Dr. M comes in and says, what are we gonna do today? I said, nothing. Did you find a hospital to take me? No. Okay, well, it's like, all right, well, enjoy your day. And he leaves. Same rodeo, sisters come, etc. same thing. In that cold room by myself. <sighs> day four, which now brought me to 22 weeks and two days to be exact. And I woke up that morning and I said, I'm not feeling too good about today. I'm not feeling great. I feel like today is gonna be a bad day. I feel like today is gonna be the day. Dr. M comes in early in the morning, same combo, he leaves. About two hours in, I call the nurse and I said, and by, by, the, by the way, those four days that I was there, no nurse came and checked vitals. They never, they never did anything for me. Nothing. They never checked my vitals. They never checked anything. I literally, after Dr. M left in the morning, I did not see any medical staff at all. None. So I called the nurse's station. I said, hi, I'm just calling because I'm pretty sure I'm in labor again. And I'm very, and she says, okay, let me call Dr. M. And calls Dr. M and Dr. M says, oh, tell her she's fine calls back and she's like oh dr m says that you're fine just rest and i'm like listen i'm in labor like if maybe if we listened four days ago i wouldn't be in this situation so she actually comes in the room and she says yeah i'm pretty sure you're in labor so i remember her wheeling me out of the room to back to the delivery room and I remember she passed the elevator doors and the minute she passed the elevator doors, the door swing open and there's my older sister. And I just remember. Wanting to jump out of my skin. Get into her arms. I just remember thinking, oh my God, I lost. My I, I fought so hard and I lost. My babies are gonna die in this hospital in my arms and nobody's gonna give them the chance. Nobody values them the way that I do. I just said to my sister, call my husband, I'm in labor. And I'm wheeled back to the room and she's out there calling our family. And I just remember being hooked up to the monitors and all of a sudden, like an angel sent straight from God, Dr. H walks in. He says, Miss Ibera, I read your chart and I see that you're 22 weeks and two days and you want your daughters to be saved. I'm telling you right now, nobody around us saves at this gestation, but I'm going to call. I will call all the NICUs around us to see if anybody will within five minutes. He was back in the room with his coat on. And he says, Detroit and London agreed to take you. And we're going to London and I'm coming with you. <laughs> it was the first time in four days I had felt some type of hope that, okay, we are, they're, um, they're not going to be born here. They're not going to be held while they die. <laughs> and so now we're on our way to London. I'm in full active labor at this time with Dr. H there. 
we get to London and the minute I'm rolled into London, Dr. H hands over to my care and they look at, they hook me up to the monitors and they say, wow, your oxygen level is really low. I believe I was in the really low, the really low 80s at that time. <laughs> They're putting oxygen on my face and I'm irritated. I'm sla I'm in pain. I'm slapping the oxygen off my face. And they said, not for you, for them. If, if it's not for you, for them. And the minute they said that I put it on, I would do anything for them, anything to give them a better chance of life. So the doctor on, she comes up to me and she says, these babies can't survive at this gestation. And I looked at her and I said, listen, I'm not here for the conversations. You guys agreed to take me. I want you to intervene and save my babies. She leaves. I'm now wheeled to the OR. They're giving me, they had gave me an epidural. They told me because baby A's water was broken, baby B's water was not. The girls are fraternal twins. They had their own placentas, own sacs. That in case baby B needed to be C-sectioned out emergency, they would have to put me to sleep if they didn't give me the epidural. And they didn't think the girls would live long enough that if they put me to sleep that I wouldn't have met them when they were alive by the time I had woken up. They said we're gonna give you the epidural so if that happens and they said that also they were trying to keep baby b in and take out baby a so now i'm all prepped we're getting ready to give birth and the same doctor comes in and she goes are you sure like you're probably gonna do more damage to them than anything by having us intubate them their lungs do not have the capacity to be intubated we're just gonna wait for your husband and make and mind you guys i'm in full labor wait for this decision i remember looking at her and i said do your damn job and save my kids and i said don't wait for my husband you you're it's the wrong one he's gonna do nothing for you do your job and save my kids and she said all right let's go let's do it and the minute i went to push baby a my my sister was there and the minute i went to push baby a my husband runs through the operating room and here this baby comes out and they they say the NICU team is behind this big sliding glass and they yell to the NICU team we thought baby a's water broke she's coming out fully in her water her water 100 percent broke like i was i was there it was an ocean so they break her water they break whatever's left of her water and mind you this whole time luna's foot was visible if you would lean me back and look back her foot was touchable and visible in my birth canal she her her foot was physically outside of my birth canal she was breached thank god because if her brain was the one that was sitting in the birth canal she wouldn't have lived so they say break the water so they break it and then they hold up this little baby the best way i can describe it it's like a kitten when they're first born and she lets out the tiniest little cry and they told me she would they would be born still they they probably won't even be born alive mrs ibera and this little baby they held her up 14 ounces 11 inches long with her machine on her that was her weight and they held her up and they said baby a and just like that she was gone they look on the monitor they're like, okay, baby B, she's not doing well. Her heart rate's dropping, she's struggling. We have to get her out. So 19 minutes later, here comes B, Emma Rose. She comes out crying as well. And they held her up and say, baby B. And she was one pound, 12 inches, and she was swept away, just like that. She was gone. <laughs> B's Emma's placenta was stuck inside me so it took about an hour to an hour and a half to remove that there was lots of doctor's hands in me there was lots of pounding on my stomach it was very traumatic very very painful um, they were at the point that they were going to have to surgically remove the placenta but thank god after literally beating me on the table we got the placenta out and then my sister comes in and she she shows me these pictures of these babies 
and I am just oh, blown away at their appearance blown away and I'm wheeled in and I see my darling little girls who look so fragile and the doctor says you know those were some of the easiest babies I have ever intubated my 14 ounce and one pound baby because they came fighting they were ready they were ready I was ready they were ready and they weren't gonna fight that too they were ready for it they wanted God had a mission for them and they 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 were gonna see that mission through and I seen them and their fingers were no bigger their whole hand was no bigger than that pinky tiny tiny but mighty little girls and they sweep them off to the NICU and then they bring me down they say Miss Iberia your oxygen's really low we're gonna run some tests on you they bring me down they run some tests they find out I have ammonia I had ammonia for days at the other hospital most likely not only would I have died in that hospital but I mean not only would my girls have died in that hospital but I was probably trucking pretty close behind them and so I go to my room and I go to sleep after they give me my medicine for my ammonia and it's hours later it's wee into the morning and I go to sleep and I this is the first time I have slept in days and the doctor comes in and she says Miss Ibera you want to come down and see the girls I just want you to spend as much time with them that you can because like their chances of survival are zero we think the most time you will get with them is 24 hours and we're, we're running out of time I go down there and I see them and I'm like there's no way there's no way that they're gonna come out of this there's no way I'm gonna come out of this the same person and from that day life had changed drastically for me 24 hours turn into 48 hours 48 hours turn into 72 hours and everyone's like what is going on who are these kids like what is happening they're telling me this is surreal like this does not happen this is impossible for this to happen but i knew there was nothing impossible for god nothing there's nothing impossible if he wanted them here they were going to be here there's nothing impossible for him the girls had a very average NICU stay. Um, they had, Emma had one really, really big scare where she was um, resuscitated with um, compressions and adrenaline. Luna was very touch and go for the first 40 days. They thought she wasn't gonna come off the ventilator and then they thought she wasn't going to survive. A lot of the times her oxygen level was very high. It was very touch and go. I was never wavering. They're not coming off oxygen. I'm not taking them off. I'm, I'm not wavering in this. I'm going to see it through. When they declare that they can't do it anymore, I will honor my daughters and do that. But I'm not going to take them off because it's hard for the doctors. I'm not taking them off because it's hard for me to see my babies in that much pain. Addicted to fentanyl. Addicted to pain management. I'm not taking them off because of that. Because I want to see them through. I, I, don't, I want to see them through. I want to give them the chance that they deserve. And then after 40 days, my babies came off the, came out of being intubated and they were on CPAP and they said, wow, this is crazy. This is, this is remarkable. They got their brain scans back with very little damage. They had a grade one to a grade two, depending on what hospital doctor you ask. And if you don't, aren't familiar with the brain and the, the grades grade one and grade two show very very little neurological damage to the long-term effects of a child wow how is that possible they they said they will be vegetables because their brains will be so damaged because they're so sensitive they will be mush and then here they are they, with very little damage so then we are 10 weeks at the London's Children Health center i so said they think we think you're ready to go back to windsor and see out your stay and that was the hardest thing was to leave that hospital they had saved my babies 
and you know afterwards they had all the hospitals had sat down and have reviewed this case after i got policies changed at our local hospital and there was six doctors in that hospital in the london children health hospital in the NICU and three of them said had they been on the night that dr h had called they would have denied me three of the six even though they had witnessed the miraculous lives of Luna and Emma right before their eyes, right in their hospital, right in their walls. Three of them said they would have still denied me. What a blessing that it wasn't one of them. We go back to L Windsor. We see out our NICU stay there for an additional eight weeks. The girls are discharged at 38 weeks gestation on very low oxygen. They came home on feeding tubes for about a week and a half and they came off of all that. They came off of oxygen um, within two months of being home from the NICU. They were completely breathing on their own, eating on their own, all of those things. And the last two, three years of their lives, there has been some scary situations. Emma was on life support last year um, in Detroit, which was very traumatic. She was diag the girls were diagnosed with um, chronic lungs, so they have BPD pulmonary pulmonary dysplasia <laughs> bronchial pulmonary dysplasia google that um so bpd they have chronic lung disease emma has asthma um but otherwise these two little girls who were born at 22 weeks and two days given zero percent chance of survival 14 ounces one pound 11 inches 12 inches told never walk never talk never eat by themselves would only get 24 hours of life if we're lucky are celebrating their third birthday this month not only do they walk talk breathe by themselves they are potty trained they have showed to be advanced in all of their devel developmental appointments they are breathing living testimonies of the work that God can do, the work that he has done in their lives and the mission that he has put us on. And that mission is 22 Matters. So we run a organization called 22 Matters. I am a co-founder and one of my best friends, Amy, is also a co-founder with me. Her son was, um, her water broke at 22 weeks and she was lucky enough to hold on for weeks after that and she has her sweet little boy as well she works we work side by side with each other we have created a world map of hospitals that intervene at 22 weeks so if a mother is like me in a hospital looking on google for these hospitals that do not exist they cannot find them if they have my world map they can see and just like that i would have been able to see had I, this map existed when i was in labor that hamilton and Toronto, which are three and four hours away from where I was sitting, had, oh, and Ottawa, had routinely saved at 22 weeks. Routinely saved at 22 weeks. So had this map existed, I would have known that. So that's what our map is for. It is to provide these parents with the equipment to get to hospitals that are willing to save their children that early. We work side by side with parents every single day, helping them advocate, helping them use proper terminology, helping them stand up to these doctors who are telling them it is impossible. We share success stories of babies who are born at 21 to 22 weeks that are thriving. How can you deny that this is possible when there's a child right there? We share the stories of those babies that were left without the care that they deserve, without their parents getting the care that they deserve. We help their legacy stay alive because they were worth it they were always worth it 22 matters is a mission that we hope changes the world that we hope changes people's view on the life and gestation of a baby born as premature as 21 and 22 weeks because of emma luna that mission exists today three years later and we have zero plans on letting that mission go until we can get worldwide viability standards change from 24 to 22 weeks in equipped hospitals and countries.
If you want to learn more about our organization, you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook at 22 Matters and you can find out all that you need to find out from there. And so, what is left to be said? I work every day to advocate for the lives of my daughters and I put their faces out there to show the world that they were worthy at 21 weeks and five days, worthy at 22 and two. They didn't need to be 24 weeks to be worthy. They were always worthy. God seen it, even when nobody else could see it. When I was so angry, he was saying, hold on, my child, hold on. I have bigger things for you and I couldn't see it, but he always seen it. This was always my story. This was always going to be my story. This was always going to be my mission, always. And even when I was angry, he loved me. Even when my faith was the size of a mustard seed, he said, hold on, stop and wait. I got it. Give me a second. I got it. And he got it. He had it all this time, all this time. And that is the God that I am proud to worship and to praise every single day. That even in the midst of that valley, he never gave up on me. Even in the midst of me cursing him in anger, not wanting to pray to him, not wanting to speak his name, he never gave up on me. And that's the God that I worship. And my daughters are a living, walking testimony of that God. The miracles that he still performs on this earth today. And to my sweet baby girls, Luna, Raquel, and Emma Rose. Oh, my darlings, I can't believe you're turning three. I don't think you will ever understand how proud I am to be your mom. You have shown me what true strength really looks like of a baby the size of a pop can, you have shown true strength. You are so brave. You are so kind. You are so sweet. You carry our family with so much light and I am so proud of you. I am so proud of the things that you have accomplished. And even if you didn't walk or talk, or feed yourself or be potty trained by three I would have loved you anyways and I would have been so proud of you then and I'm so proud of you now and I never for a minute doubted you and it has been the best three years of my life being your mom and I'm so proud to be your mom and I can't wait to spend the rest of my life with you my sweet girls showing the world how powerful you are and how powerful the God we serve is and I cannot wait for you to do wonderful miraculous things and change this world for the better happy third birthday I love you so much and I am so 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 proud of you <laughs> if you have made it this far in the video thank you for watching if you have supported 22 matters thank you if you have supported our book drives our toy drives thank you if you have shared the twin story thank you if you have prayed thank you if you continue to share your babies with us thank you this could not be what it is without all of you. And we are forever grateful for that. So I hope you enjoyed this small condensed version of what and why 22 Martyrs exist and who Luna and Emma are. And I thank you for watching. And to my sweet girls, happy birthday. I hope one day you watch this. And you see the power of a mother's love that I would have given the world for you. And I would have shook in the core of that hospital until my last breath for you. Because you were worthy then, my sweet baby girls. You are worthy now and you will forever, ever be worthy. I love you.